Hello, welcome to AT&T Threat Track for June 17th, 2014. This program provides network security highlights, discussion, and countermeasures for cyber threats. Today I'm joined by Matt Kaiser. And Matt, we've been looking at the Game Over Zeus takedown activity and the progress associated with that. Any, any comments? Uh, seems to be going well enough. Uh, one thing that I would recommend to our viewers is that if you have the chance, and you're watching, obviously, uh, go to US CERT's website, check out some of the links they have there, see if you're infected or not, because a lot of this takedown is going to be contingent on users actually taking some action on their own as well. Yeah, good point. You know, we've been uh, reporting on the, the zero access spot net and the infections associated with that and how slowly they're, you know, the, they're, they're disappearing. It, it's taking place, but uh, that doesn't happen by accident. Just because they've beheaded the botnet doesn't mean the infections have gone away. Mm -hmm. So, good point. Uh, also joined here by uh, John Hogeboom here in the studio, and uh, what we call a studio. And uh, John, you've been busy with your new car, so I'm, I'm not going to expect you to. New car, um, but that hasn't stopped me. You know, we're still we're looking at uh, lately been looking at lots of new sources of threat intelligence and integrating that stuff with our or existing systems, so that's kind of been tying up my week this past okay. week. Well, I'm sure you're going to have some comments as we go through the program here as well. Yep. And uh, joined online by Jim Kleising. And Jim, I know you've been busy with some forensics activities. Uh, can you tell us a, a, a tip or something? Yeah, well, one of the things that uh, really came to mind in the most recent investigation I was working on is how helpful it is if system administrators um, really understand and are monitoring their systems, you know, file integrity checks, knowing when something on your system has changed so that you can go back and see was that change legitimate or was that the bad guys somehow getting in and doing something, you know, can really speed up detection and, you know, shorten the, the time that the bad guys have to do nasty things on your systems. All right. Absolutely true. So a lot of health checks that you would typically do in terms of operation of the system can also help you to identify suspect activity that could have a security relationship. Absolutely. Yeah. And like I said, I've been a big fan of file integrity checkers for 20 years now. And the kinds of things that enable you to detect when something may have changed that wasn't, you know, part of your change control process. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you, you bring to mind, actually, a, a sort of a side point is that, you know, one of the things that we try to do is get the security operations folks very closely oriented toward uh, the folks that are doing network operations, for example. And one of the reasons for that is that, you know, the folks that are busy with the network operations, they see an operational issue or something like that. The first thing on their mind is to get things working again, whereas the security guy, if they're at least privy to this type of activity, it gives them an opportunity to think, is there any potential that there's something malicious going on here? So getting those two uh, mindsets together, you know, sort of the conspiracy theorists, we're paid to be conspiracy theorists here, uh, and uh, working with the folks that are busy trying to get things back into operation can be very complimentary. I think you're, you're basically making that point. Okay, so let's get to our first story here. And the uh, first one is, uh, well, Game Over Zeus may be down and out, but there's new... Right. Perhaps so, not so new, but uh, well, certainly no, some new. pretty powerful banking malware right. out so there. So it's been getting a lot of traction this past week. Uh, there's a new banking malware out there called, I'm not sure the pronunciation because it's new. Uh, it's either Dyrza um, or, or sometimes also called just Dyer. And that comes from a string that's in the, uh, uh, in the, the code when they mm -hmm. look at the binary. They're able to see that that's in there. And uh, this was reported by Network World. There's a couple of other people also that uh, did a little more analysis. So this one's being distributed by uh, phishing emails. One has the subject of your Fed tax payment. So obviously they're kind of trying to key in on the recent, you know, back in April, everybody put, did their taxes. Mm -hmm. So they're probably trying to, you know, leverage that as a means to coerce people to click on these. Um, and then there's another one, uh, an invoice number. That's a very s typical scheme that we see with just invoice number and some random number uh, and that you have to remit your payment. And there's links in each of these. So they're not mm -hmm. attachments. They're actually links, which is not completely uncommon. The one thing that's a little interesting about this one is they've been leveraging a service called cubby.com, mm -hmm. which is part of the log me in service. And uh, it's a place to store files and whatnot. You know, they've used Dropbox in the past. A lot of these other actors have used Dropbox. Dropbox is pretty good about taking these down pretty quickly when they're notified about them. The log me in slash cubby.com people might not be as quick to react. It's a legitimate service. 
but it's one that you know they're starting to use now so they might get a little more time before people realize that mm -hmm. uh, the malware is being hosted there uh, it arrives as a .scr file one of the interesting things about this does not appear to be an offshoot of the zeus family we know we've seen a lot of other variants that are based on the original mm -hmm. zeus source code that was kind of distributed out there publicly in the public domain this does not appear at least right now to be related to that it seems to be its own kind of thing uh, it uses browser hooking similar to what Zeus had done, uh, and that allows it to intercept uh, what's going on inside your browser, even and when it's- the browser is sometimes is referred yeah, it's, to, right? Yeah, it is. It's also, they're also calling it more of a man in the middle because mm -hmm. uh, what they're doing is they're browser hooking to intercept the SSL communications for certain banking websites. Right. And instead of actually just kind of getting the form data off of them, uh, which is what Zeus would do, it's actually kind of proxying the traffic to their own server in clear text. Oh. And then it does SSL to the actual banking website and whatnot. Okay. So they're kind of in the middle as well here. Um, they're using some of their own infrastructure to pass what's going on between the browser and the bad guys mm -hmm. kind of middle man in the middle uh, infrastructure and then to the real banking site. One of the things about, you know, just being in the browser is if the banking website has pin codes and whatnot, mm -hmm. those are temporary. So even if they're able to harvest the passwords, unless they can leverage it really quickly, they're not gonna be able to really do much with that. Mm -hmm. With this man in the middle, more of an aspect, they can really get in the middle of the entire transaction and do it more real time as opposed Absolutely. to harvesting passwords after the fact. So it seems like, I mean, I, I could be wrong about that, but it seems like that would be more detectable by the banks themselves. Yes, you would because think so. Because, you know, the originating addresses for a lot of these connections are going to start to see some overlaps and things like that. So hopefully there's a, right. a latch they can catch on to. I haven't any mention of that aspect or any comments from banks uh, related to this activity, but mm -hmm. you would think that that would be the case. And they also, uh, I think the CS CSIS or the Fish Me guys, I can't remember which, uh, in part of their investigation, they did discover that there is a... Um, uh, a money mule panel, kind of control panel, mm -hmm. for, and mo money mules are, you know, these humans that kind of, they use them to uh, temporarily hold the funds that are stolen in their own personal bank accounts and then mm -hmm. transfer them out, usually via wire transfer or something like that. So they've discovered a, a control panel for this money mule related to this uh, activity with most of the accounts in Riga, Latvia. So again, you've got, you know, Eastern European type activity here, uh, not unusual for crimeware type stuff. Uh, so, you know, another one to be watchful for. We know we had Zeus Game Over was recently taken down. Maybe this is going to fill the void a little bit or at least temporarily fill the void uh, that uh, was replaced here. If you don't have signatures already for it, take a look at it. You should be able to pick up any of this activity because it's kind of unique in the way it manifests on your network. Well, the one thing that I thought was kind of cool was that you see the... Um the request for the, the actual command and control and right below it in the same exact you know traffic, you have the, a, a dump basically of what was sent from the victim's machine as a second set of HTTP headers. Right, right. So from like a, a, a packet analysis, you know, packet jockey kind of perspective, I think that's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. Right, you can actually see what should have been encrypted mm -hmm. to the right. real banking website right. is all clear text in this kind of man in the middle exchange that's mm -hmm. occurring, right. All right, thanks John and uh, Matt, I guess uh, there's some developments in the Asprox botnet. Um, that one's been around for a little about it a has. little while, right? Yep. So it's it's a fairly well known botnet, uh, known mm -hmm. for sending spam. Um, FireEye put out a blog post I found particularly interesting, talking about how over time they've been evolving the capabilities of the botnet, mm -hmm. and in particular in the last month or so, there's been some interesting developments. Um, the latest campaigns that they've been seeing have been. Another kind, one of those, you know, urgent, you must take action things mm -hmm. where they're sending a message saying you've got an upcoming court date. And right. naturally, anyone who sees that they have an upcoming court date will have a minor panic attack and immediately open up that. You yeah, get attachment. that little adrenaline shot as soon like, as you read it. You know, mm -hmm. what did I miss? Exactly. <laughs> a period of irrational thinking, right? Exactly. <laughs> so they're actually uh, attaching the malware as a zip attachment, which mm -hmm. is one of the main common ways of sending malware. Right. I think it's a little less sophisticated, but what is interesting about that is that the attachment itself, over the period of time that they watched, it was modified a total of 6,400 times in at least one day. Wow. That suggests some serious automation, and, and mm -hmm. not, I'm not sure if it's repacking or small modifications. They were using MD5 hashes as a way of telling the different samples. Mm -hmm. So I don't know exactly what was being changed, but the fact that they made the effort to change it so many different times mm -hmm. suggests that they're trying to keep ahead of the antivirus game 
so that as samples are detected, brand new ones are baked and sent out. So that for a whole day, you know, you'll practically be ahead of the curve. Uh, I found that to be particularly interesting. Mm -hmm. um, it's the the stats they gave where it was like a sixteen thousand percent increase in the number of samples, something like that. I didn't check the math myself, but it, <laughs> regardless, it's a lot of it's a lot of samples. Right. What was also interesting is that over a period of several months, they gave uh, at least two months. They showed that the the infrastructure used for the uh, the spamming actually changed completely. Mm -hmm. It was they as if they dropped one set and brought up a brand new set of servers and started over. And those are sort of that's verging on you know advanced techniques. There, they're really mm -hmm. trying to stay undetected not only from a sample, malware sample standpoint, but from an infrastructure standpoint, makes it much harder for someone to actually take action and block them. So what is being used to draw the relationship between, how do we know it's the same folks? I'm not sure exactly. Okay. If I had to speculate, I would say that it's a combination of the, tech, the tactics and, and lures they're using in the email, potentially also the malware samples themselves. Okay, yeah. So, well, I was going to say uh, another interesting uh, maybe study that could be done is even though they're recompiling this over and over again and getting new MD5 hashes and whatnot, it'd be interesting to run imp hash, mm -hmm. uh, which is that import hash technique that we talked about before to see how much they differ, if at all, uh, mm -hmm. uh, between those kinds of things. Because you would think if it's automated, they're really probably not changing the source code all that much, and the imp hash is probably very similar or the same on all those. So impashing SSD and potentially the, the right. section headers as well in the... Right. So the, all the those... Interesting analysis to do on that. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Very good. John, let's go back to you for a moment here. And, uh, you know, we've been reporting for quite some time about scanning activity on port 5000. I think you had actually found the, uh, what the likely cause associated with this. So let's take a look back in time a little bit here. Yeah. There's some new developments in this, or at least yeah. some new discoveries. And back in March 11th of 2014, we had been talking about the scanning activity on port 5000 TCP, uh, probably even prior to that, but we weren't quite sure what it was until around the March 11th timeframe. You know, in our honeypots, we had picked up some of this activity and we were able to determine, hey, what they're really looking for here is a vulnerability associated with the Synology Disk Station Manager mm -hmm. software, which personally I wasn't really familiar with all that much, other than it being an embedded type of appliance that does network attached storage. Uh, you know, it's kind of a home device. I think subsequent to that, probably about a month later, I know some of the guys over at SANS, I think Johannes Ulrich had done some research in this as well, mm -hmm. and uh, had discovered that there were dropping some Bitcoin mining types of uh, applications on these devices. Recently, uh, I guess, within the past week or so here, they confirmed that yes, it is a botnet kind of composed of these Synology network attached storage devices. They're mining a particular kind of cryptocurrency called Dogecoin, which I think we might've even talked about at the time. I think Johannes's article might've covered that. Um, and they, uh, they've discovered, I guess, through you know looking at how the Dogecoin and how many have been kind of uh, checked in and whatnot relative to that, that um, the actor behind this has uh, uh, acquired about 365,000 pounds or 620,000 US dollars of Dogecoin through this cryptocurrency mining activity. The interesting thing about Dogecoin is that it's a little bit easier. It's computationally less expensive, although not trivial by any you know, stretch of the imagination, mm -hmm. than Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin is very difficult to mine uh, nowadays, uh, but Dogecoin is considerably easier. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even though, and, and even still, using one of these devices, which is kind of a low powered device, uh, doesn't have a lot of computing power for it to do this mining operation. It uses more in electricity than mm -hmm. it does what you get back. Of course, the actor doesn't really care about that because. He, it's not his device. He's right. you know illegally using it to, to engage in this activity. Mm -hmm. uh, so just an interesting finding that the, that there's some actual statistics here, some understanding of how much uh, uh, actual currency has been mined via this activity. Right. right. And then uh, we have a chart here as well that kind of shows this activity has trailed off considerably. It hasn't gone back to zero, but it's definitely way down from what it had been uh, in terms of them scanning for and finding uh, right. new devices to. To compromise here. Yeah, and that, you know we've talked about this number of times. It shows that you know a very distinct sawtooth pattern where they've initiated the botnet to go out and and do scanning activity to look for vulnerable devices. Now, but this is 
very clearly associated with the recruiting activity. It doesn't necessarily have any uh, indication of the device is actually being used for computational purposes. In fact, it might be quite the opposite. You would tend to have them being used for computational purposes opposite of the recruiting activities. They would be uh, in conflict with each other in terms of processing capacity. Right. You might have one part of the botnet doing this scanning, recruiting, and another right. part actually engaged in the uh, cryptocurrency mining activities. Right. Well, I'm sure this, uh, whoever the actor is that's behind this has um, reported this on their taxes. Yeah, I'm sure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> One thing that I thought was interesting in light of what you were saying earlier about how um, security ops and network ops should be working together more closely to find those those little aberrations that might lead to some security issue being found. Mm -hmm. I believe the Dell SecureWorks blog had to say that um, the Synology forums were actually one of the first places people started to discover this was happening because okay. they were having such terrible performance on oh, their devices on their drives. that someone had to look into it. Right, right. Yeah, and, I, and then when they did look into it, they started to notice there was a process name called Pwned, P-W-N-E-D, which was, if they had changed the name to something a little bit more reasonable, they might not have been discovered quite or as quickly, the bad a, guys. It was taking a little longer, absolutely. Right, but so. um, uh, I did see that as well, that they, you know, people were asking on the Synology forums, what is this pwned process mm -hmm. running on my device? Brings us back to the point that Jim made very early in the program here, is it's, you know, having a little bit of an understanding of what has changed on the system can give you some good insights into what might be going wrong. Absolutely. Let's go to Jim here. And, uh, you know, a lot of people are getting, you know, U.S. just won their soccer game yesterday. That's a big deal. It may be the only one, but hopefully, you know, hopefully it'll continue along here. But um, I guess along those lines, uh, there are always uh, people that are going to take advantage of these media events. And uh, Jim, perhaps you have some comments about this? The World Cup is the is the big athletic event going on right now. And it's you know got the, the attention of the whole world. And uh, whenever you've got big events like this, the bad guys try to take advantage of it. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen it in the past in any number of ways. This week saw a couple of stories, uh, one from the HelpNet security on some Android apps that are targeting Android users with uh, World Cup themed stuff and another article on the eSecurity Planet on mm -hmm. just some of the more generic phishing schemes that you might see because of the World Cup. As I said, you know, whenever you get a big event like this or, you know, big news event, you know, celebrities die, you know, royal weddings, we always see them, you know, coming out of the woodwork with fake stuff to try to draw, draw you in and get you to click on the wrong thing and have the bad guys own your device. Yep. Absolutely. Um, and so the, the World Cup is, is the latest of those. Um, you know, so there are several, several Android apps uh, that have been out there and generally taken down as quickly as they're found. Some malicious advertising, some phishing campaigns, um, all targeting the World Cup. And then there's also the, uh, the DDoS attacks. Anonymous promised back in February, I think, that they were going to try to DDoS related to the World Cup. There was a, a ZDNet story last week that suggested that there were at least a couple of sites that get, did get DDoSed last week. Personally, I haven't been following the World Cup close enough to notice if those sites are all back up yet or not. But uh, as I said, it's the current big event going on, so the bad guys are going to try to take advantage of that however yeah. they can. Yep, absolutely. And this is one that certainly has a lot of, uh, uh, you know, global visibility, you know, probably rivaling the Olympics nowadays. And so it's one of those aspects that you really have to sort of take into account and, uh, you know, be vigil vigilant about the, uh, the possibility of some malicious actors being involved in it. Not in the event itself, of course. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, let's build on that theme a little bit here. You know, one of the things that I happened to run across recently was an article that was, uh, I think, originally from research from uh, Fortinet, and uh, this uh, basically the headline associated with this: Does iOS malware actually exist? And uh, you know, sort of the point behind the article, just to summarize it very quickly, is uh, they only had an inventory of about eleven 
pieces of malware that were associated with iOS devices. And of those, I think only seven of those, or, or seven eight. of those, seven or eight, eight it was eight. Required, uh, eight of them required the device to be jailbroken. Right. So uh, that's, uh, I think only some- Only three were, right, a non-jailbreaking type of, right. Right, right. So uh, the, the significance here is that, uh, you know, if you if you just follow some basic guidelines, the same guidelines that we've been sharing with our, with our audience, uh, Stay with the uh, with the app store. Stay with the uh, mainstream markets, and uh, don't jailbreak your device. You really are in a pretty good position with iOS devices now. For Android, it was a completely different story. And uh, I think uh, perhaps Jim, you can uh, kind of follow up here and tell us a little bit more about what's going on in the Android space. Yes, the Android has been the the easier one. To, for the bad guys to go after, and we've been saying that for a long time. Having said that, the the amount of Android malware is actually still relatively small. We talked a couple of weeks ago about the Kohler Android malware, the the, uh, the ransomware that popped something up and threatened to encrypt your files on your Android device but didn't actually do it. This week, the folks at F-Secure did find a piece of malware they're calling... S Locker, which was targeting some Russian devices and was actually really ransomware. Mm. Uh, it really did go out and encrypt JPEGs, GIFs, PDFs, doc files, AVI files, you know, multimedia files, uh, MP3s, MP4s. Then gave you a Russian address or phone number that you needed to, you know, contact and transfer money to in order mm -hmm. to get the key to unlock your device. And then there was also a, an interesting story on uh, the GData blog about a certain brand of Android phones coming out of China that had some malware pre-installed in the firmware, which makes it extremely difficult to get rid of. Yeah, it hasn't been a great week for uh, you know for the Android. On the other hand, as I said. We make a big deal out of it because the bad guys have been targeting the Androids a lot more than the iOS because it's easier to develop for, and so there is a lot more stuff out there for it. But the the percentage of software out there for the Android that is malicious is is still very very small. So don't don't mean to be scaring people. And again, if you take our advice and you stick to the mainstream markets. They've been doing a very, very good job for a long time of as soon as they're aware of malware, they, they get it out of there. The Chinese one, the UUPay, is in the firmware and it's disguised as the Google Play Store application. You know, because it's in in the firmware, it gets written to the RAM disk before anything else in the OS gets loaded. It's actually like the old boot attack that we've talked about a couple of times on here. To fix it, you actually have to jailbreak it so you can flash firmware on it. Mm -hmm. So th that one's kind of nasty. I have mm -hmm. not heard that it's all that widespread, but it was from a, a particular Chinese manufacturer. Haven't seen a whole lot more detail on it, but uh, that's one I tend to intend to follow up on here okay. as we get some more details on it. All right. Well, if we have some more details, hopefully we can follow up on that next week. And, uh, you know, hopefully this was something that was discovered relatively early because obviously that would be a, a pretty big inconvenience to have to, you know, basically reflash your device and start from scratch. And or have to throw yeah. it away entirely. Or have to, well, I, I, would, I would think you could take it back. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe that was an intended feature. You never know. The one article I saw said that they've been showing up on, you know, eBay and places like that where you might not be able to take them back. Oh, well, good point. Yep, absolutely. All right, so, well, I mean, the buyer beware. So let's take a little bit of a look on the, at the activity that's been taking place on the Internet over the last week or so here. And uh, if you're really pressed for time, just go and look at last week's because there are not any significant changes here. And um, But we'll go and take, take a look, look at them and uh, have a, a few little comments. First one is uh, scan probes on port 18186 TCP. Now, we had uh, basically uh, investigated this. This is actually associated with a particular, uh, basically with a healthcare type application, but I don't think that's really what's being looked for. We uh, are speculating that it has something to do with checkpoint firewall. I honestly don't know 
exactly what the application is that they're hunting for, but the fact is, is they're uh, continuing to hunt for it and they are basically persistent doing that. Uh, that's been going on for the last couple of weeks now and you can see uh, clearly the activities there. Now, relatively speaking, we, we had mentioned before that this could possibly be related to uh, scanning activity on port 135. I'm a little less uh, convinced that that's the case. There are some, certainly some similarities in the, in the activity. Uh, we'll take a look at the uh, port 135 uh, scanning activity in a moment here. But one thing that I'd like to point out is that this activity is not nearly as aggressive as the uh, scanning activity we've seen on port 135. Next one here is scan probes and sources. Uh, we've seen a significant increase in the sources scanning on port 7778 TCP. We talked about this last week as well. That's associated with the Oracle HTTP server and the last round of updates where there were some critical updates associated with the, the Oracle database. Those were issued in April. Now, I don't know if this is a delayed response to that activity. We mentioned last week that we've seen it actually fairly typically that when the updates have come out, there's been scanning activity looking for them. This one is particularly aggressive in activity. It, it, not hugely aggressive, but uh, what we're seeing here in terms of, again, that sawtooth pattern that we uh, talked about on port 5000 earlier, we're seeing that sort of activity here as well, where we're seeing on the order of hundreds of sources that are doing scanning activity. It's tapering off, and we saw a resurgence of the activity just a, a couple of days ago. Certainly, there may be some, uh, something that somebody has found to be interesting. Hey, Brian, for those who don't know what that botnet sawtooth pattern indicates, can you explain a little bit more? Oh, certainly. You know, when uh, obviously a botnet is a large number of uh, computers that are under a central command and control. And uh, as you can see, there's a very abrupt uh, start in the activity associated with the scanning activity. Basically, uh, somebody issued a command to a lot of the devices and said, you know, go out and scan on this port and try to find devices that potentially to have this service available and potentially uh, are, are, uh, would be vulnerable to exploit. Now, as the devices are doing that processing, they may have been given a command that say, you know, go, go scan 65,000 addresses or 100,000 addresses or a million or something like that. Different devices are going to have different processing loads associated with them. And so over time, different devices are going to complete their task in a different amount of time. And so you start to see the the devices dropping off in terms of that, you know, performing that activity over at, at different times as well. So you start to see this decay of, uh, of that activity. And then when the botnet operator comes back and issues the command again, it jumps back up and then they start uh, that decay process subsequently as well. So uh, we see that quite often in, you know, botnet activity where they're in reconnaissance activity where they're given some sort of command to do something. And we see that in denial service attacks as well, where they'll be uh, told to go out and you know perform a denial service attack, and then eventually, uh, you know, in fact, sometimes the uh, the devices will be told to do a denial service attack, and it may be indefinite. They lose the command and control, and so you'll see the uh, those bots continue they'll continue doing that but that denial service attack indefinitely, despite the fact that the botnet operator has told them to stop. So it's sort of the inverse type effect that uh, sometimes can occur. Good question, Matt. And uh, next one here is uh, bytes. Speaking of denial of service attacks, uh, bytes on source port 161 UDP. This is a simple network management protocol, and uh, as we've been reporting many times, this is another protocol that's being used in uh, reflection type denial of service attacks. We're seeing numerous targets in this attack activity. I'm showing 180 days of activity here, so you can see the uh, change in the trend. Still not significantly large attacks relative to some of the things that we've seen with like network time protocol and, and uh, DNS being used in reflections, but it's all matter perspective. I'm looking at it and describing it to you in terms of what an internet service provider would look at it as, but if you were on the receiving end of any one of these attacks, it would not be insignificant. These are up in the orders of you know hundreds of megabits per second. Most end users would find that to be somewhat devastating if they don't have some sort of a protection plan in place. So. Uh, this is something you know, want to watch out for. You know, if you're getting an, an attack of this type, you can filter out anything with source port 161, and that'll help to do things so long as you have the capacity to do it, or you can uh, use a DDoS mitigation provider to do that. Even still, you'd probably want to filter it out further upstream than... than further upstream is know, better. Depending on it, who you are and, right. and what type of service you have. If you're just filtering it at your local router right before it gets into your enterprise, that mm -hmm. might not really help you that much because uh, it's still hitting you. Yeah, good point. And you know, the other 
the other aspect of this that I, um, I'm not showing is that you're show, we're looking at one port here. Most of these attacks have multiple facets associated with them. There may be a SYN attack combined with uh, maybe using other ports for, uh, for real function attack activity. So this is one set of activity and uh, I did not go in to do analysis to see if for any one of these targets that we saw other types of traffic associated with those as well. So it could have been much larger for any one of those victims. Next item here is, uh, we already alluded to this, uh, the scan probes on port 135 TCP. This is the endpoint mapping uh, application associated with Microsoft. It's not really used uh, in uh, modern Windows operating systems, but it still apparently has some interest out there. Most of these probes are coming from multiple addresses in China. We've been reporting that. The one thing I wanted to sort of point out here is there was a resurgence of activity here as well. This on the, uh, looks like the, uh, on June 12th, there was a resurgence of that activity. There apparently is a renewed interest. I'll, I'll look at it, you know, look at it that way. I think you can see perhaps subtly there's a little bit of a sawtooth pattern in, in this activity as well, but it has some different characteristics. So that's part of what's kind of making me a little bit softer about the relationship between port 118, 186 activity and this one is they just don't seem to have the exact same pattern of activity. So perhaps they're not as related as, as I originally thought. Looking at the top 10 most probed ports here, no significant movement. We have a little bit of movement in there, but nothing significant. We already talked about port 135 TCP. Port 22 TCP is next, that's SSH. 1433 TCP, that's Microsoft SQL database. Port 445, all of these are typically seen in here. Port 53 UDP, 80 TCP, port 23 TCP, Telnet. Port 8080 TCP, an alternative port for uh, port 80 or for web. 3389 remote desktop protocol and last on here is uh, port 443 TCP. Now, we haven't shown much related to port 22 recently, so I wanted to give you a little bit additional insight into that. A couple of things that are worth observing. This is 90 days of activity of scanning, that is scan probes on port 22 TCP. And you can see that there are some, you know, little surges of activity that are taking place. And then other areas that are of interest here, notice there are some gaps in the activity. This is uh, right around, it looks like May 30th or May 31st where it, it effectively turned off for a period of time and you see these little gaps in activity that are taking place there. That is real. That is, that's not an interruption in our data analysis activity. That's a real interruption in the scanning activity, which gives you a pretty strong indication that there's really one thing behind most of this scanning activity. And uh, as you know, any provider is concerned about uh, impact to their, uh, uh, their operations, uh, you know, this botnet operator that's performing the scanning activity apparently had some disruption in their, in their operations activities as well, but quickly fixed that and resumed their scanning activity. That's uh, one aspect of this that is it appears that most of this activity is associated with a single organization. And then the other aspect of it is we are seeing a bit of an upward trend here in terms of continuing to probe on this port. And in most cases, we've seen this it appears to be password guessing activities and sometimes sort of educated password guessing, sometimes just looking for relatively mundane default passwords, that sort of thing. And the next item here is the uh, top 10 most sources doing probing and uh, port 445 being at the top of the list, nothing unusual there, followed by port 23 TCP, port 80, port 8080. We have some gaming activities showing up here at port 27015, that's point-to-point -point activity, P2P. And then we also have a uh, port associated with the zero access botnet. Forgive me here, I'm drawing a blank. 17788, we talked about that last week and uh, I don't recall specifically what that was. So I'm gonna have to go back and refer to my notes from last week. We did actually investigate this, but I neglected to update it for today. And the last thing I wanted to show here is the daily reconnaissance index. This basically looks at the amount of probing activity we've seen over the last 400 days. Clearly, we are continuing to see an upward trend. We're almost at the highest point that we've seen, at least over the last year. Not quite, there was a little spike uh, otherwise, but this would be attributable to, we saw the increase in the scanning activity on port 135 and other activities. I mentioned the uh, sort of the, the subtle upward trend in port 22 activity as well. But notably, the number of sources that are actually doing that probing has gone down a little bit, contrary to the, uh, in terms of the number of probes gone up significantly. So if we were seeing a large increase in the number of sources that were doing the probing, that would indicate, you know, a large botnet that's, uh, that's propagating and, or, you know, perhaps even a worm, uh, one type of concern that we have 
and then the uh, number of probes is really just a, sort of an indication of how aggressively uh, maybe smaller groups are doing the uh, probing activity. I think that might have been PP stream at 1770. Oh, absolutely right. Yes, which is thank a you. Streaming PP. media. Chinese right. in it's origin. A, it's a, uh, so it's a legitimate application. Yeah, legitimate application, that we've seen. but for yeah. streaming television or something like yeah, that. Yeah, thank you, John. Okay, so that's our show for today. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can email us at threattrack at list.att.com. Uh, to get notice of new episodes, you can follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at threattrack. And uh, just a reminder, it's T H R E A T T R A Q. Uh, the Threat Track is, uh, video is available on the AT&T Tech Channel. It's att.com slash threat track. It's also available on YouTube at the AT&T Tech Channel on YouTube. Uh, there's an audio-only version available on iTunes. And I'd like to thank you for joining us today. Thank you, John. Thank you, Matt. And uh, thank you, Jim, online. And uh, thank you to your dogs as well <laughs> for joining us today. We'll be back next week with a new episode. And until then... Keep your network safe.